As we get started, I uh, just want to share a couple things with us uh, together. First of all, we want to, uh, as, as you're joining us today, we want you to know we will be uh, recording the session uh, today. If you prefer not to be recorded or photographed, uh, you may wish to mute your mic and disable your video. Uh, by continuing to participate in the conversation with your video or audio on after the recording begins, you consent to allow InterVarsity to use the recording in any screenshots of our conversation for InterVarsity ministry purposes, including posting a video recording online for asynchronous viewing. I'll stop recording for a moment. Uh, so if you want to disable your uh, video and audio, uh, you can do so. Just want to briefly introduce our, our uh, conversation partner for today. Uh, Douglas Birch is uh, the co-pastor of Evergreen Foursquare Church in Auburn, Washington. He serves on the U.S. Doctrine Committee, International Doctrine Community, Committee, and Education Commission of the Foursquare Church. And he's taught theology courses as an adjunct faculty for Life Pacific College and Life Ministry Institute. He's earned a Doctor of Ministry from George Fox Evangelical Seminary with his dissertation research focused on social media. As a former newspaper columnist and talk radio host, Doug has produced and hosted over 1200 Christian radio broadcasts. He's the producer and host of Fairly Spirit, the Fairly Spiritual radio program and podcast. And we're gonna put the links uh, to his podcast and also his website uh, into the chat so that you can access those as well as other links that we'll be talking about today. So if once I do that and uh, we'll exit share, uh, Doug and I will enter into conversation. So um, let me get this into the ch these things into the chat real quick. Okay, well, I'm really happy that we could have you on today and for the converse, uh, chance to have some conversation about social media. Well, I'm glad to be here, although it was unfair for you to show that picture of me that's pre pandemic when I was skinnier and healthy and <laughs> full of life. <laughs> no, I'm just we're kidding. I'm so glad we're to all be here. trying to get back there, you know. <laughs> uh, we all would love to be back there. And so it's probably not bad to have those memories. <laughs> yeah. But um, at any rate, I'm I am really thrilled. I, I think a lot of us have wrestled with, uh, a lot of us are on social media, and at the same time we wrestle with uh, uh, the anger and rancor that we encounter, the divisiveness and echo chambers, and we wish it could be a better place. Um, I wonder if we might start by just talking a little bit about the move that you made from the talk radio world, which can be its own kind of crazy place, uh, to doing more work on social media and what that transition was like for you. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, first I'm talking with a bunch of scholars, so I, I don't know how scholarly I'll be as I also spent the morning on Twitter. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about this aspect of my life is I did Christian radio for like five years. And most Christian radio stations are owned by very conservative entities. Salem Communication owns most uh, Christian radio stations. They're a publicly traded company, and they're very uh, far-right conservative. And uh, for me, I, somehow the Lord allowed me to be on the air. That's a long story, but I had a daily 4 to 6 p.m. talk show, and my goal was to facilitate a conversation that welcomed Democrats and Republicans, moderates, Green Party, the whole work. And I just thought we wanted to have a better discussion. Uh, I realized, though, that that wasn't necessarily what people wanted. And so for five years, I did that. And I was relatively successful. I mean, I wasn't fired. 
but I realized that that's not really what people wanted. Most talk radio is built on this. You find a base and you speak to that base. So you get a bunch of conservatives to agree with you or a bunch of progressives to agree with you. It's usually more conservative. And then you preach to the choir and you unite around liked interest. Well, eventually I left radio. And one of the things I noticed, which other people are noticing here, is that it seemed like that talk show radio format followed me into the internet, that everyone has become their own talk show host. And we find our trending topics. We give our strong opinions about it. We rally people around us who agree on those topics and those who don't, we discard. And so that aspect kind of got me thinking in terms of you know what's happening, how can we facilitate a reconciling dialogue and, and how can we not you know, have that even spread more, which I think is one of the most toxic aspects in our society where we just have people who have opinions about everything, even if they know nothing about it, rallying people around them uh, in a very divisive way that does very little to build community. Well, you talk about, actually, it's interesting that both this, this talk radio media and social media often seem to be very angry places. Why is that? Hmm. Uh, well, one of the things that I talk about in the book is Marshall McLuhan, which most of you would know is a technological theorist, very popular in the mid 70s. And he said uh, a quote that's fun to say, the medium is the message. And the basic concept of that is uh, every medium at some level influences the messaging. And for Christians, I think sometimes we think, oh, a new medium, it's just we're going to say the same message, just in a different context. But we don't realize how much it, it actually changes the messaging, changes what we message, and changes our culture. And whether it was the printing press, I was thinking the other day about the printing press, who tends to write books? People who are organized, people who can actually follow through and, and write 60,000 or 80,000 words. So that medium influences who's sharing the messages. People who aren't as organized, more random, abstract they're not going to share the message. So it influences what messages we hear, what we talk about. It influences our whole culture. We found that with television as well. And we're finding that with the internet and with radio uh, and, and any other medium. So that's the part I wanted to look at is for me, social media has a tendency to dehumanize people. And we all know this at some level, but I don't think we're taking seriously the ways it truly dehumanizes us, the aspects of our brain that we use and the aspects we don't use. And then how that is actually changing what we message and how we message. So that's kind of the big research theory to me. I wanted to get into how technology is changing us and not just make it about moral issues. Like people are more wicked these days or they're more divisive this day because we've lost our moral core. I think Christians sometimes go to those answers and we don't instead look at some of the practical sociological or technological things that are influencing the parts of humanity that we're expressing to each other. You know, you talked about a couple of concepts in your book that I think relate to this. Uh, you spoke about net, networked individualism and disincarnate or discarnate communication. Yeah. Uh, would you explain those ideas a little bit more and how they affect our communication online? Yeah, first, I, I think I'll start with networked individualism. I think it was Rainey and Wellman. I think they're with Pew Research, and they'd written some books on this. Now, they talk about this in a positive light. They say the strength of the internet is whatever my individual needs are, I can find a network that meets those needs. And this is the strength of the internet. This isn't one of those, the internet's terrible, let's go become Amish kind of books. But there's a reality that the strength of the internet is whatever personal need I have, I can Google, I can search, and I can find a group of people to meet those needs. So I have extreme political opinions and I can find people with those extreme political opinions. Uh, I, I love Star Trek. I can just isolate around Star Trek or I can isolate around Star Wars. So uh, we begin to use the internet primarily for our individualistic needs to be met. I have a certain theological conviction. Let me find people who are like that in my theological convictions. The problem, though, with networked individualism is we begin to use people as products to meet our individualistic needs. And we begin to only interact with them as much as they meet our individualistic needs. And so everything becomes very transactional. It also causes this, is that we have more weak tie relationships than ever before. Uh, a weak tie relationship is a relationship where you unite around maybe one thing. A weak tie relationship could be you both like soccer. 
are, are you're both, and here's a, here's an important issue. You've both been abused by the church. And so you unite in a group that's about church too and about abuse. That's, that's not a wrong uniting, but the problem is it's only uniting around one issue. And then the moment conflict occurs in that group or the group becomes more diverse in their understanding of the issue, then people fracture because we're uniting around one thing as much as it meets my needs. And the moment it doesn't meet my needs, or it goes into more complicated, diverse, deep waters, we fracture. And so what you're seeing, and you see this with kids, I'm sure you're seeing it with some of your students, you see it uh, with your own kids, is they'll say, I have more relationships than ever. Maybe there's a thousand people on Facebook or Insta or Twitter or whatever it is, but I feel like none of them really know me. I feel like I have to maintain all these relationships. And as much as I agree or, or focus on this one topic, I'm with them, but if I don't, I just, disappear. I, I, I don't have those kinds of relationships that go beyond just shared likes, shared wants. And so that's what I think is one of the biggest problems with networked individualism. The strength, my individual needs can be met. The weakness is community. Community isn't about just my needs, right? Community is about what God collectively wants with us as a people. And as Christians, we're called to bless the rest of the people on the face of the earth. Part of our job is to build community. So that's one aspect of networked individualism. And the, and the other one you brought up, what did you ask about? It was- um, Discarnate communication. Oh yeah, discarnate. And this is another one with Marshall McLuhan. I love books that 20 years later, they're still relevant. A lot of technology books aren't very relevant even five years later, but he used the term discarnate that the church has not taken seriously what discarnate uh, mediums do to an incarnational gospel. And I think that's an aspect we need to look at because internet communication is disembodied. I'm, I'm not in the room with the person. Uh, and there's an aspect of not being in the room with the person that influences the way we communicate the incarnation. And the practical, there's so many practical implications of that. You know, one of the issues obviously is even in Zoom, you and I can at least see each other. I know I'm not offending you, hopefully not. You know, you can hear my voice intonations and know that I'm not shouting these things at you. So those things are removed, right? In most online conflicts, it becomes text driven. We, by the way, whenever you're on Facebook and you see longer and longer text, like these longer and longer, you know they're fighting about something, right? It, it just gets longer and longer. And or threats in that, on Twitter, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? And in that context, you can't get intonation. You can't see whether the person is crying as they're writing or snarling as they're writing, or they're insecure and scared and feeling threatened and attacked. And we're having all those issues. It's discarnate in the fact that we only use certain parts of our brain. Scientists have shown when we write and read, we only use certain aspects of our brain fire. And those aspects aren't always the best aspect in big picture thinking, in problem solving, in emotional connections. So we're using this technology more and more to argue the biggest issues of our time, yet this technology doesn't allow for the full expression of humanity, particularly the incarnational nature of being with someone in the room, interacting about an important issue. You know, one of the other things that uh, you, I, I don't think you get into this in the book, and I'd be curious what you think about it. Social media itself, help shape these conversations by the algorithms of showing you what you most want to see, uh, what you've tended to click on. It pays it, it, it extracts all that information and feeds you what you seem to be most interested in. Would yeah. You say more about that. Yeah. And I do address this uh, in the context of segmentation uh, and two forms of segmentation occur. One, just the algorithms themselves. And we all know that, right? You buy something on Amazon. It says people who bought this also bought this. You friend someone and it recommends, here's some other friends you can follow. And so the technology is segmenting us at one level. Uh, there's also our personal segmentation where we're choosing to go in directions uh, that best serve our interest. Mm -hmm. And that fits in with the networked individualism. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with this is it, it exaggerates and polarizes extremes. It's the strength and the weakness of this communication. And I think we're seeing this with conspiracy theories. Uh, you know, if before internet communication and someone had a weird idea, how did they get that idea even out? Hand out pamphlets maybe? 
maybe they'd find someone else they could whisper it to. But there was kind of this collective, I'm not saying this is even right, but a collective shaming, like we, we're not going to listen to you, buddy. That's your weird stuff. Well, online, you can find what? A hundred, a hundred thousand people who believe in your weirdness. And there's something collectively that the more people who gather that collective community idea, the more we begin to believe that it validates the conceptions or, or the ideas, no matter how crazy they are. Uh, and so that aspect of segmentation, I mentioned this in the book that we have to intentionally work against the segmentation. And from a reconciling point of view, that's to break down the dividing walls of hostility, right? It would be that there are things that are dividing us into Jew and Gentile. And the Jews are just hanging out and the Gentiles are just hanging out. The women are just hanging out. The men are just hanging out. White people are just hanging out. We have to break down those dividing walls. So you have to be intentional. Look at who you follow. How diverse is my following? Uh, is it a bunch of white middle-class men? That's what I'd say to me. You know, is, is it a bunch of Presbyterians? Is it a bunch of Christians? Is it a bunch of far right or far left people? If I want to engage in bringing the truth to people and engage this world, then I need to see, am I segmenting myself and intentionally follow people that I wouldn't normally follow or the technology wouldn't recommend mm -hmm. to me? So that's a practical implication. If we don't work against the technology, we'll end up segmented without even realizing it. So we have to intentionally look at, am I hanging out with a bunch of old people? <laughs> am I only hanging out with young people, right? That part is an intentionality that you have to have because the technology is not going to do it. And frankly, your own even emotional wants is probably not going to do it because mm -hmm. we gravitate towards people who are like us. It is the nature of human existence. You know, some people at least, I think, see all these, see these trends, see the echo chambers, see the anger, um, see misinformation and other things on, on online. And they just say, I need to get off their way of, you know, their way of dealing with it is just, okay, I, I just, I, I just need to get off social media. And the question is, uh, you know, what, so one of my questions is, is why not just get off of it? If there's so many if it's so problematic, why not just leave it? Well, one of the things I'm careful to do is not say everybody needs to do it the way I do it. People are far too diverse. Like one, we have different callings. Uh, we also have different mental health. And for some people, their mental health may require that they place boundaries on their social media communication that are different than mine. Uh, so I just think it would be profound arrogance to tell people the amount they should be online. However, I would say this is some of the most important topics and discussions and realities in our culture are the di dialogue is happening online. And I would think at some level, we would want Christians to be in those dialogues. But one of the arguments I have for the book is that it's not that we're in the arguments with just different content or different ideology or different theology, but we're actually online with a different spirit. And that the be best witness of Christ would be that Christians are radically different in the way they use social media, the way they argue, the way they go through a conflict. This isn't an argument to not have conflict. Christ causes conflict. But am I causing conflict because I want to be right and I want you to be wrong? Or am I genuinely causing conflict because I love you and I'm trying to advance the dialogue of the kingdom that reconciles the lost? To God. And so to me, the segmenting or the isolating is sometimes an issue of privilege. And often the reason we can isolate from these social media discussions is that these things don't necessarily impact us. It's, it's fascinating with, with oppressed groups. I think one, you have more freedom to do whatever. If, if, if you are a black person in America, social media is toxic. So I'm not going to say you need to be online to contend for the rights of uh, minority groups or oppressed groups. However, the reason many of our black brothers and sisters are online is because they can't opt out of these discussions. They can't choose to enter into or not enter into issues of justice. So to me, uh, because I live in a privileged world and a lot of these things don't actually impact me, I think I need to intentionally engage in these environments that might make me feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I need to... To, you know, not use my privilege to isolate and deal with the fact that I'm comfortable just hanging out with my wife and kids. And that's true outside the online world. I'm a pastor, but I would rather hang out with my wife than my congregation. I'd, I'd rather just, I like her more than other people. I'm sorry. 
but I'm not called to take what God has created and just to use it to serve myself. He created a healthy marriage, but I'm called to serve the creator, which means I go into communities that are conflicted, angry, bitter, hurt, and I bring the light and life of Jesus Christ to them. And I think online, we have to find some way, and it might be different. You know, it might just be listening, might be very limited interaction, but if we're not engaging the most important discussions of our time, we're in trouble. And the other thing is regardless of being online, the online world is influencing our in-person communication. And if we want to stay relevant with our in-person communication, at some level, we got to know what's going on online because you'll see what's happening online, filtering into the classroom, filtering into how we debate and dialogue, even assessment for professors. I noticed I know some of you have had this, our assessment culture. Assessments 10 years ago or 20 years ago, they were pretty like, oh, you know, good class, it's okay. Now people will give their opinions, like just unfiltered. They're not more negative. They're not more mean. They're just raised in a culture where assessment is just what you do and you don't take it personal. Now, for me, I take it incredibly personal. Well, I need to know what's going on online so that when I interact with that in person, I don't make wrong assessments about how people are communicating to me. You know, one of the things I really appreciate, I uh, appreciate a lot of this. You speak a lot about reconciliation in your book. There's yeah. kind of almost a whole theology of reconciliation that is really part of what you've written. What, what are, and I think you've elaborated some of this already, but uh, maybe say a little more about what an online presence committed to reconciliation looks like. Well, I appreciate you noticing I did try to articulate a theology of reconciliation. Uh, it would have been longer if my editors had let me, but they're like, Doug, you know, a little... <laughs> a little <laughs> so what about social longer. media, not reconciliation? I, they were, by the way, they were right. I'm not, I'm not arguing against that. It was like, you know, pastors like, oh, I got more to say about that. Let me talk about the cross, <laughs> you know, but that was not the... Uh, are the only focus. Uh, I use the word peacemaking because when we say reconciliation, what do people think in the popular vernacular? They think primarily in terms of racial reconciliation, which is legitimate reconciliation in a discussion. But we know from a biblical point of view, when the Bible talks about reconciliation, our Paul says that we've all been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation. That's a much more broad topic. It's the reconciliation that has occurred through Christ Jesus, where, where we are, have access to our Father. There's no intermediaries between us and God. And, and different theological conceptions will say this differently, but they all, at some level, talk about the cross as an expression of reconciliation, that we are drawn closer to God. So if that is the primary mandate of Christians to be engaged in the ministry of reconciliation, which I don't think we can opt out of, I don't think it's like, well, that's not my thing, that's what we do. And so I talk about how Christ, of course, uh, is, is the, uh, you know, the author of reconciliation and how the Apostle Paul's ministry is really an expression of reconciliation through time, even after the cross and the ascension, that we are still entering into the reconciliation that God has provided. But this is one of the things that technology does. It, it, we begin to lose focus. Here's a perfect example. Politics. I hear some Christians say this, that Christians shouldn't be about politics. And I know what they're saying. They're saying, uh, they're, they're trying to say we shouldn't be arguing and yelling and fighting with each other. But to say Christians shouldn't be concerned with politics is kind of a naive idea. Everything's political. If you live in America, uh, you're supposed to have political opinions. Our government runs by that. You're supposed to make educated decisions based on how you think the government should run. Uh, what people are talking about is partisan politics, and not just that I'm part of a party, but partisan politics almost go directly against reconciliation. Partisan politics is I want my side to win, your side to lose. I want us to have the control and you to have no control. I want us to stay and you to leave. This is our country, our America, not your America. Partisan politics communicate my truth, my way. That's the only way. Love it or leave it. That's not reconciliation. A reconciling politic is, I care about these political things, but I'm communicating them to you because I love you. But I actually believe that I have some truth here, and I believe you might have engaged with a lie, or you might not have the fullness of the truth, and I'm actively contending for this political conviction because I love you, and I want you to come into the truth, or into the light, or into the life. 
many Christians do not distinguish between those two things. They use the same po political communication as Tucker Carlson or Rush Limbaugh or anyone who their goal was not reconciliation. Their goal isn't the gospel or the kingdom. Their goal is to build their audience, to maintain their group, uh, to preach to the choir. So that's to me where reconciliation fits into social media. One, the technology is pushing us against reconciliation. And two, our culture is not distinguishing between the communication of truth and the communication of reconciling truth. Mm. And, and that part, all of us have to deal with, because I think, haven't you found yourself, let's say even in marriage, where you start talking about, I'm right, and you're wrong, and you get in a fight, but you realize you're not working towards reconciliation anymore. You're not working towards, you're just mad and upset and trying to win the argument. And a healthy marriage counselor comes in and says, you know what? It's not about winning the argument right now. We're going to de-escalate this. We're going to first attach that we love each other and we're called to be together. And then we're going to deal with these issues in a climate of love. Well, that's true with our families. It's true in our church. And even with strangers at some level, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them and don't expect to be repaid. You know, the things Jesus said, reconciliation has to be a motivator. And because it's not a reconciling platform, we've got to be intentional. We've got to be thoughtful. We have to facilitate discussions like this. Hey, we're going to take a break here and talk a little bit about your book. <laughs> So let me put that up on the screen. A few more, another slide here. Uh, so the book we've been talking about today is called Posting Peace, Why Social Media Divides Us and What We Can Do About It. Uh, and uh, we have a special offer for those on the call here. Uh, you can order the book at InterVarsity Press for a 30% discount uh, and just include the uh, discount code GFMWEB21, GFMWEB21, and uh, you'll get that discount on your order. Uh, so I would encourage you, if you found that uh, some of the ideas that uh, Douglas has been talking about helpful, and I, I certainly did in the book, and there's a lot more in the book than we were able to get to in a short conversation here. Uh, I hope you'll uh, pick up the book and give it a read. So now we want to go to some uh, question and answer time. And uh, if you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and put those in the chat. Um, I haven't seen anything yet uh, for that, but uh, please, we'd love to get some other questions in the chat from people. Um, and by the way, while you're doing that, I just wanted to let people know one of the things, this is a, as a pastor and as a teacher, I don't like giving people a lot of application, like you need to do this, 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 and that. And so each chapter has a uh, posting piece challenge where people can take the ideas and put them into their own context. And so that's what I'm getting excited about, because I totally agree that people could disagree with maybe the conclusions I come to. But I do know it begins to get us thinking about technology. Every technology extends human capacity and weakens the capacity it extends. That's a powerful concept. Uh, McLuhan said that as well. So the internet is extending some of our human capacity. And as it's extending it, it's weakening it. It's actually, we're able to connect with more people, but we're not able to know how to maintain and form long lasting connections. And so those kinds of concepts, groups can go through, classes can go through. And then you just apply it, you know, you apply it to your life and see how you're doing it and ask yourself those questions. Uh, and so that to me has been what people have said is, has helped them, forcing them to, well, not what Doug says, but what is God saying to me about how I use social media? And uh, uh, Douglas has even created a hashtag, hashtag posting peace, <laughs> yeah. uh, where you can post some of your own thoughts and insights. And I suspect he might even engage you with some of that. Well, that's why I do it. I think it's great. It's, it's not just a technique to, hey, you can get the title out there, but now it allows anyone who goes through it, I can look up the hashtag and then I can interact with their thoughts and see how they're processing it. So I kind of like that as a way for, to build community online. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Um, and uh, at any rate, uh, as, we're, uh, as we wait for some question and answer, one of the things I uh, wanted to ask you about, we were talking about that in our conversation before we started recording, 
uh, the amount of misinformation and disinformation that we encounter online just seems to have exploded and particularly around election seasons. Uh, and what are your suggestions for Christians in terms of dealing with that? There are times where it's just like, I can't let that pass. I know that's just a blatant lie. <laughs> you know, I, is this, I think this is a struggle we are all dealing with. And I would, I honestly would be a fool to say, I really know what we can do right now because I'm seeing things that I just never thought I would see. Basic uh, Twitter every day has some sort of correction. It'll say, no, uh, robot chickens did not vote in the last election. That is false. <laughs> and, and I'm like, who believes that robot chickens, and there's a whole group. And I, so that primarily is the is issue of segmentation. So I think at some level, instead of just speaking about the individual issues, we need to more encourage people of stuff that we all should hypothetically be able to agree with. So if somebody, let's say, is stuck in that world, you'd say, hey, you care about the truth, don't you? You care about uh, what are your relationships? Do you have a lot of diverse relationships? You know, one of the things I ask my, whenever I hear a friend saying something really strongly about, like, let's say Black Lives Matter, right? There's some people who just will say extreme statements. And I'll have some, especially white people who will just say some extreme things. And instead of arguing the extreme statement, I just ask them, what do your black pastor friends think about this? <laughs> and what you find is that many of those people don't have those relationships. And so I can argue with them, but my goal isn't to win an argument. My goal is to facilitate relationship. And if I can find a way to get that person in communication with a more diverse expression, and it's even, you know, millennials these days, blah, 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 you know, okay, fine. What do your millennial friends say about this? Uh, teacher unions, you know, what do your teachers say about this, right? And what you can find, you can find who someone loves by how they talk about a group in generalities. And the more people you know within that group, the less willing you are to speak in hostile negative generalities. So to me, one of the ways we can do that in education and in the church context is to contend for what do reconcil reconciling environments look like? Uh, is it just all, everybody who agrees with me or am I going to be with people who don't agree with me? Uh, is the first goal to communicate truth or to build relationship? Because even if you say something true and I don't know you, I'm probably going to reject it just because how dare this person tell me this truth? They don't know who I am. So to me, that's another principle. So someone who's just writing things and justifying their rightness, you can ask the question, is it reconciling? Are you changing anyone's hearts? Have you built more you know, diverse relationships? Are you speaking into lives you haven't before? Or are you just becoming more and more isolated with people just like you? And I think you can say, even if you have the truth, who cares? Because you're actually becoming of use to no one. So those are the challenges I think we at least have to have in the education aspect. Uh, and then I, I do think, you know, we have to, we can't just isolate. We have to say something about, you know, what we're doing this with vaccines. We take the picture of me with a vaccine, not because I'm trying to brag that I got one, but just so people know as a pastor that I believe in science and this is an appropriate thing. So instead of getting an argument about vaccines, I just show by who I am uh, and, and how I live. So, but I, I think that's going to be the books coming out in the next few years. You know what they're going to be about. It's like, what do we do with QAnon and conspiracy and truth? That is what I think all of us are struggling with is the centrality of truth. And one of the reasons we've got rid of the gatekeepers. And so now the concept of someone having more moral authority or more educational authority or more, it's just all ideas are equal. They just come to us and flash to us. We don't know how to even make a hierarchy of what's important or what isn't important. Paul raises a question here for us, and I think it's related to what we've been talking about. Are there any thoughts that you have on drawing those who are in a focused echo chamber of media to look at more varied resources or sources? Yeah, and I think, again, this is probably going to have to be relational. We, I think, it, may, it might have been Neil Postman talked about technology glut, and this, of course, before the internet, but we just have, 
so much technology that we tend to think more information will save people. It's the tendency of, I'm just going to give better information or more information. I don't think that's true. I do think we have to focus in on building relationships versus uh, building followers or more information. And relationships means that I've walked with this person enough that they'll let me bring in things that they'll consider. They'll let me bring in ideas. They'll let me bring in books. But if they don't know me, I'm just segmented. We all know that, right? The moment you bring something in, you immediately become segmented. Well, you're just a far right this. You're just a far left this. And any of us who kind of are maybe in different areas and moderate in some areas and conservative and progressive and like, we don't even know how to communicate because immediately we become segmented into those groups. And online, we have to be intentional. That takes extra work. And so the first interaction to me is first for the person to know you can trust me. I love you. I'm trying to build, uh, I respect you as an individual, much more listening, much more tell me more. Interesting. I didn't think of it that way. What else do you think? I disagree, but I really appreciate you expressing that. I'd like to talk about this more, those sorts of things. But in the immediacy of the internet, we often want to get the argument, give the answer, get the material. But if they don't know that we're for them, or God is for them through us, they're going to disregard it. So I, I know that sounds hard, but if we're all doing that collectively, we have a better chance. Christians are the ones who build relationship first, and then from relationship, then they deal with the issues and the resources and the debating and all that stuff. Yeah, I think that's really good. Um, you mentioned, you know, I, I wonder if we might take a little more time to think about uh, conflict on social media. Um, because, you know, uh, I guess I've, I have wrestled with it sometimes in terms of watching fellow believers saying things that I think are, you know, uh, just not befitting believers. I had a, I had a, I had a, a dialogue with a guy who uh, was mocking the president's tendency to stutter, which goes back to a, a disability he's had since childhood and has done some amazing things to overcome and actually help other others who struggle with that. And I just said, I, I don't think it's befitting of believers to be uh, speaking about the, uh, speaking about a whole group of people who struggle with this disability in the kind of way you're doing. I, I just, yeah, you're better than that. And I, I, I've really, I really wrestled with that when I, you know, but at the same, I didn't mind his politics, you know, uh, I don't, it's obvious he doesn't like this president. Um, but I think he's got a right to do that. Um, so what are your thoughts about how we engage even other fellow believers that we know and we see them really going? Well, the by the way, way, it's one of the, one of the things said with, with Biden there is Biden told his story that he stuttered and he overcame his stuttering. But that's not necessarily true because he still stutters. But because yeah. he initially told that story, it's it'd be... A lot of stutterers have said it'd be nice if he'd just say, I'm a stutterer, but because we view stuttering as a sign of weakness or insecurity, which is not the reality of it, that that message hasn't got out to people enough. And one of the reasons I bring that up is I'm dyslexic and uh, uh, that didn't go away. And it has great barriers to how I communicate. And people make fun of me when I get homophone usage wrongs with your and your, where I don't do the apostrophe R E and the there, there, there with different spellings of there and to and all. And it's not that I don't know the rules. It's just my dyslexic brain doesn't work well uh, with that kind of stuff. But dealing with conflict, this to me is the issue of reconciliation. Uh, are, how are we saved? It doesn't come down to this. What makes someone righteous? What makes someone saved? What, what makes someone uh, pleasing in the eyes of God. Now, I believe it's a gift of grace. It's just, it's unmerited favor. It's not because I do right things that I've been reconciled. It's the grace of God. And I think when I look at people who are attacking others based on disagreements and ideology, they have a different view of the gospel. They still have a legalistic works view of the gospel. They have this view that to be right or to be righteous means you're right. And, and they might have just a few points or a lot of points, but if I have these 20 points and I have the right answer, then I'm righteous. Or if I have the one point and I believe this, then I'm righteous. 
And so that aspect of righteousness and rightness is so tied together that when you disagree with them, you're questioning their salvation. You're questioning their righteousness. You're questioning their relationship with God. And I have to remember that because if you disagree with me, I, I don't feel like my salvation is in question. I don't even think you need to understand me. But that we were running up against that. And I think even in some mainline large denominations are running against that legalistic thread where people have believed their righteousness is based on being right. I have the right opinion on this. I, and when you bring in a different opinion, they see it as an attack on their identity. And so what do you do when someone's attacking your identity? You defend yourself and you tear down the other person. You make sure they know that you ain't more right than me. In fact, you're less righteous than me. It becomes an attack and a defense. And I think I see that in politics as well. So you can't just have that uh, Biden has a religious convictions, but he's come to different conclusions. And although I might even strongly disagree with those conclusions, I, I'm not going to attack the integrity of this person because I don't know how he stands before the Lord. And I understand it. Grace at some level is this idea that I was an enemy of God and yet he loved me. And right now I'm probably sinning daily and I don't even realize it. And I stand in a climate of grace. So how dare I judge someone else? Those aspects influence how I deal politically, right? If you don't have that view, if you have a sense, I'm right, you're wrong, my righteousness is based on being right, then you're going to take it into the political sphere. You're going to take it into the world. And that part, we see some Christians do not distinguish between those two. Now, for me, I'm just, in, I'm just shocked. And then also change. Like, if I want to change somebody, like... There's, you got to have someone you love who loves President Biden or someone you loved who loved George Bush, whatever. And if you tear down someone they love, what does it say about that relationship? People are detaching from their grandkids. They're not talking. Uncles are unfavoring nephews and all mm -hmm. because of a political view, because it's so much attached to their identity. But for me, I want to find a way, you know, for someone to know that that is the gospel. While we were enemies, we were loved. So even if this person is my enemy, even if Biden is the enemy of the gospel, it's pretty clear what Jesus tells us to do with enemies. It's pretty clear, at least scripturally, at least I thought it was. <laughs> so how do we do that in an, in an online setting? Well, uh, Kathy asks the question that presses that out a little bit more too, in terms of your own practice. Uh, she, she wishes she had access to your book this past year. There's so much she resonates with and appreciates how you parse out political and partisan politics. Uh, I also appreciate your emphasis on reconciliation. That's what we are about as Christians. It doesn't mean uniformity, getting to people just to think like we do. She asks, out of curiosity, how much time do you spend posting or responding online? How often do you write a post and then, and then sit on it to make sure you're not being snarky? That's none of your business. <laughs> Next question. And I definitely don't do it when I should be doing other things. Uh, I, I, I do too much, but part of me, there is a ministry that I do online. I just do. Mm -hmm. Now my, that might be a justification for an addiction to Twitter. I don't know. I don't, you know how you can make like, Oh, I'm doing this for the Lord, but I might just yeah. be doing I don't, God, <laughs> God knows, but I really am able to speak to so many different people. I just, I have extreme conservative, extreme uh, progressive uh, atheists, all the whole works. And one day I'm waiting for them all to figure out who I am and everyone to reject me. I'm waiting for that day when they all like, who is this guy? And they, they attack you. So, so for me, I do it quite often. I, I try to, I try to make social media as unfiltered as possible. Like I don't want them to see the tip of the iceberg. I want them to see me. And then also I want to make sure that I'm not processing my identity online and trying to gain something from these online communications. So I'm not sharing my hurt uh, for me as a pastor, I show hurt and vulnerability to normalize it, to let other pastors know they're not alone. So that's one of the things I do. I share things like, I felt like quitting today. Uh, and I do that because I know there's many pastors who feel like quitting, but they can't say that. Mm -hmm. They don't. Mm -hmm. So I want to normalize that being a pastor means you feel like quitting or you're confused or you're hurt or you're vulnerable. So I make it very personal. And then I let people reject the core of who I am. I, I don't, I, mm -hmm. I can just say, I'm sorry, you don't like that about me, but this is who I am. This is how I feel. So that's how I use it. I also use it for dumb jokes and mime jokes and such. But the other one is as far as not saying snarky things, every conflict is an opportunity for change. 
And it's not our first interaction that defines us. It's our reaction to what happens. And that's why we have to be okay. If I post something that offends someone, I have an opportunity now to show them what reconciliation looks like. I, I, you know, I remember someone accusing me of mansplaining and I had to go look it up. This is back when I didn't know what mansplaining was. And I was like, how dare you? And the defensiveness in me was that I'm going to explain how I'm not a mansplainer. By the way, that's not a good way to get out of being accused of mansplaining is to explain yourself. It, it doesn't go well for you, right? It just doesn't. But I know Charles Kraft talked about that all communication is receptor oriented. It's not what I intend to communicate. It's what you actually received. And I know I don't like that. And I might've had all the best intentions in the world, but someone received the fact that I was being misogynistic or condescending in my communication. What do I have an opportunity to do? To be Christ, to be Philippians too, to lower myself and become the servant of all, to come in and genuinely say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was not my intention, but it doesn't matter if that was my intention. If, if, if you felt like you were being attacked here, that I'm, I'm sorry. That's not my goal. And I want to hear you. I want to communicate in a better way. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for telling me how you felt. If I work at reconciliation, then I can build a relationship. If I work at defending myself, what is it? Well, I wasn't trying to mansplain. I was really trying to do this. And then we go to the defensive part. And defensiveness almost always makes us distant. Reconciliation draws us closer. Will it work? This is a great way to deal with trolling or trolling behavior. If your first response is reconciling, you'll either see the person just double down and treat you terribly, and you know they're just trying to make people upset. But other people, you'll see a person rise up. So as a pastor, some people have been hurt by pastors. So I write something about the church. You know, we need to encourage our pastors or something. And then someone writes back, all oh, pastors are blah, blah, blah. And they say some terrible thing, right? If I take that personal, I might start defending myself. But if I ask him another question to say, I care about this, why do you say that? Or I humanize myself, that's not my goal, but I know it's the goal of others. You can suddenly see someone go, oh, I'm sorry. I've just been hurt by pastors and I had someone treat me poorly. And you, a person rises up and now you have a relationship with a wounded person. But that requires your goal is to build community. If your goal is to defend yourself as a pastor, you lose that opportunity and you get in an argument that says, but not, not all pastors are what about ism or all those things. So that to me is how I engage whether to communicate and whether to stop communicating. And I, in the book, I give examples of when you should block and mute trolls. And there are times for your own mental health and to keep them from sinning against you, you should block them. You're not helping them by interacting with them and you're not helping yourself. You're just perpetuating sin as they're repeatedly sinning against you. You don't have to do that. You can block them and hand them over to Satan. So it's not just about being a doormat, intentionally laying down your life and intentionally following the Holy Spirit in every interaction. Uh, Doug, this is great. Uh, I have a question. Uh, thanks for a great conversation. I often see posts that are false or misleading, especially regarding vaccines, politics. What do you think the best response is? To comment, mm -hmm. uh, to send a direct message, ignore, how do you think this changes depending on how well I know the poster? Yeah, I think that's the big thing. And probably the person who asked this question knows the answer in some levels to that is I try to personalize. When they dehumanize, I humanize. So if it's someone I know, I try to make it as personal and bring other people out of the issue. So if I can direct message someone, if I can call them, if I can talk to them, um, more of a, a personal interaction. Uh, the danger also is I have to say, do I have authority to speak into this issue? Um, you know, if you look at your post online, this person, do I interact with them on a regular basis? Do I also share positive things? Or the only time I interact with them, is it to correct them? And just think about that. Hmm. Do you like someone that the only time they talk to you is when you did something wrong as a pastor, you know, the guy only comes up saying, well, you misquoted Luke too, you know, and you're just, you're like, it's that guy, right? We've all had that, you know, <laughs> the student who just, just kind of, they're right, but you're like, Seriously, that's I just did a two hour lecture and that's the one thing you're going to talk to me about. So that's another issue. I might be truthful. I've had to apologize to people like that because I realized I would correct them. But then I wasn't encouraging them. I wasn't validating their humanity. And immediately what they felt like they're in a defensive posture. It's like, uh oh, here's Doug. What did I do wrong? 
so correction is relational. If I don't know someone to me, uh, we know this to be the case. You can say, in my opinion, qualifiers are powerful. This is what I believe. This is what I do. This is what I've read. I know some people believe that, but this is what I believe. And then when they argue with you, instead of trying to convince them, you've gotten the information out. You can say, you know, I, I understand that others believe that. This is what I believe. And that's what I'm following. And I just wanted to give that to others. Because see, a lot of these conflicts are not about the person you're talking with. They're about the people listening in. And that's why the goal is not to convince that person that they're wrong and you're right. It's to get the information out in the most healthy, loving way possible and to trust that the people around them are in desperate need of confirmation. The spouse who agrees with you, the kids and grandkids who need someone to advocate for their existence. So remember that, that it's actually often when Jesus talked to the Pharisees, was it about the Pharisees or was it about us? It really was about us, his interactions with the Pharisees. It was about them, but it was now we make these decisions based on his interactions with the Pharisees. If you could think the same way, my goal isn't to validate my identity with this Pharisee. It's to communicate in such a way that others listening in would be able to find light and life and truth. Now, for Jesus, there's practical implications of it leads to a cross. So you may actually, by the people that you're interacting with, they may treat you terribly. But your witness to the world is something that's good, and you can stand before the Lord with integrity and say, I, you know, I, I made room for you, uh, whether a cross is your future or whether, you know, people praising you and you're a best-selling author. Uh, it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle. <laughs> well, hey, this, is, this has been great. We, need, we could probably go on for quite a while yet, but we need to bring this to a close. Uh, we, wanna, we do want people to pick up your book. Uh, John Prin uh, said, this is, this is so great. I'd like to get two copies. So maybe some of the rest of you will join John. Yeah, it's more anointed if you get two copies. I'll just let you know that it's just, there's something. No, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, we'd invite you to uh, 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 order Posting Peace at a 30% discount at uh, intervarsitypress.com front slash Posting Peace. And uh at the checkout, you can use the code GFMWeb21 and you'll get that discount. And so uh, we'd invite you to pick up a copy today. I uh, want to just tell you about our next conversation. And I'm going backwards here. Um, our next conversation uh, is going to be on June 16th, 2021. It'll be at 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern time, and you can figure out the ones between. Uh, Heather Thompson Day is our, our speaker, uh, uh, my conversation partner. She's an associate professor at Colorado Christian University, and she's written a book called It's Not My Turn, What Happens when we're waiting, While We're Waiting for Your Breakthrough, and it's really about all those situations, and many of us in, around the academic world, we, somebody else has uh, gotten that job offer, uh, somebody else has gotten their paper published, we're working you know, we're, uh, we're wondering when it will be our turn. And she explores the questions of God's invitations to us in, that, in, in those seasons where uh, we're still waiting for our turn. Uh, I think it's gonna be a really fun conversation and I look forward to engaging or, and I hope you'll join us. You can actually sign up today for the conversation at uh, tinyurl.com, not your turn. And all of the links for our conversation today are toward the top of the chat. So if you want to get the link for this, it's up there. I want to tell you about a special opportunity uh, that uh, InterVarsity, uh, InterVarsity's faculty ministry, which is uh, Emerging Scholars Network is part of, is doing this summer. We're offering a digital pilgrimage for faculty, and we actually open that to uh, those who love them as well. So if you love Christian faculty at all, or are one, you are invited, which I think is everyone here. Uh, it's uh, uh, it, uh, The pilgrimage is a virtual pilgrimage. We will get eight uh, audio guides uh, that you can use in taking walks of your own wherever you'd like to go. Uh, there's also uh, uh, some very creative art. There's debrief groups you can join and interact with others and more. And the link for that is in the chat as well. It's uh, just go to graduateandfacultyministry.org, go to the events section and you'll see uh, the item for that.
and the link is in the chat. Well, I want to just uh, conclude by, first of all, uh, thanking uh, Douglas for just a great conversation. This has been so much fun. And uh, uh, we also want to thank University Press, who has helped us with publicity and co-sponsorship uh, in uh, doing this conversation today. And we want to thank all of you who joined us. Um, we uh, do want to mention the Emerging Scholars Network, uh, which hosts these conversations. If you are a uh, uh, em emerging scholar, if you would define yourself as such in terms of being uh, in the academic world or interested in it uh, uh, as an undergrad, grad, or faculty person, you are welcome to join us. Uh, just go to our blog blog.emergingscholars.org and click the join button and fill out the form. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I touched my touchpad and it all went crazy. So uh, let me get back to that last slide. Uh, so we do invite you to join the Emerging Scholars Network. Uh, we also uh, would welcome you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, we are, are on all those social media platforms and we try to be a pretty friendly place, but also to post some really interesting content that wrestles with tough issues. Uh, lastly, uh, this conversation and our other ESN conversations over the last year uh, are available on our YouTube channel. And the easy way to get there is tinyurl.com front slash ESN YouTube. And so we hope you'll join us there. And thanks again for joining our conversation today. And Douglas, thank you so much as well. Yeah, thanks for having me. I want to let any uh, teachers know if you ever want to guest to Zoom in or something, I like doing that. You don't need to pay me anything. I, I care about students. <clears throat> so I'm free to do that as well if you're interested. Great, great. Well, and your uh, website, we posted that in the chat. And I, and I imagine people can find you from that. So yes. That would be great. Okay, well, we're going to close the recording and we'll leave uh, the connection on here for a few minutes if anybody else wants to chat informally.